This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. The hamburger is the quintessential American meal, offering more than just the perfect balance of food. Out of the many burgers available at Burger King, the Whopper takes the reins. But the idea behind the savory flame grilled Whopper didn't actually come from Burger King. In fact, a cafeteria worker turned franchise owner stole it from a dirty, rundown restaurant and then boasted Burger King as the home of the Whopper. This is the story of how it all began. Burger King's story doesn't start with the company's founders. Instead, it starts with a pair of franchisees who met as strangers, but whose lives had been surprisingly similar in a number of ways. Their names were James McLemore and David Edgerton, and they would change the face of the fast food industry forever. James was born in New York City, New York on May 30th, 1926. His father was Thomas McLemore, a former lieutenant in the U.S. Army, and his mother was Marion Floyd Whitman, a homemaker. David was born a year later in Lebanon, Pennsylvania on May 26 to Blanche Berger, a violinist who performed across the nation, and David Edgerton Sr., a hotel manager and steel mill worker. At the age of three, James's life was rocked when the U.S. stock market crashed and the Great Depression destroyed industries and devastated millions, his family included. Raid Shadow Legends has taken over and now gaming will never be the same again. Raid is the first game to bring a true console level experience to your mobile phone. They've set the bar so high that there's no going back. Explore millions of champion combinations and master countless tactics as you take on raid bosses, dungeon runs, campaign battles, and PvP arena matches. With hundreds of artifacts to equip and over 600 champions armed with unique skills, you can build your team, develop your champions, and raid your way. We've been playing Raid Shadow Legends for a while now, and so far, our top favorites include Ursala the Mourner who can revive an entire team and make them as tough as bricks. She greatly supports your damage dealers by increasing their own attack and by decreasing the attack of your enemies. You can use Ursala almost in every piece of content in the game, but PvE content with waves is where she shines. We also like the Royal Guard, who can decrease an enemy's defense while inflicting enormous damage. With his third skill, he attacks four times at random, if all four hits go to the same target, you have the chance to fully decrease that target's turn meter. This month is Raid's 3 year anniversary and the celebrations are going to be huge. As part of the kickoff, Raid just released its first ever champion skins, classic, heroic, and iconic. Skins let you alter a champion's appearance to something that suits your style and preference. This is the best time to get started in Raid, and if you click on the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen, you'll get a free starter pack worth almost $40. We're talking three free champions all at once. Misery Cord, Tiger Soul, Romero, plus 10 Magic XP Bros, 10 Force XP Bros, 10 Spirit Bros. That's huge! All this treasure will be waiting for you here. It's super easy. Just click the link in the description to get started. The Whitman family fortune was gone, and when James's grandfather died at the age of 76, James was convinced the sudden loss of his family's finances was the reason. James's mother, likewise, didn't take the Great Depression well. She was committed to a sanitarium where she spent the rest of her days. James never saw her again. The Depression had taken its toll on James's father as well. He lost his job in New York, and with Marion gone, he moved the family out to the Whitman family farm in Edge Hill. There, James's grandmother would look after him and his two siblings while Thomas traveled to and from New York City by train to work at a bank. Then, four years after the stock market crash, a fire ravaged Edge Hill and ended its days as a working farm. In order to make ends meet, James's grandmother had to sell half 
of the 200-acre property and many of her most valuable possessions as well. Four years after the fire, James's grandmother made a decision. She wanted the grandchildren she had raised to attend college, and she knew that the best path they'd have would be through boarding school. To raise the money for tuition, she sold more of her valuables. She sent James's older sister Claire to Northfield Seminary in Massachusetts first and planned to send James to its sister school, Mount Hermon School for Boys, two years later. Tragically, she would never get to see it. She died of a severe heart attack the next year. Still, her wish for James to attend boarding school was fulfilled. The next year, he set out for Mount Hermon, and while he missed his family and had difficulty adjusting to the new life at first, he came to thrive there. In his senior year, James was even elected class president. When tested for aptitude, the school advised James to think about a career in business, specifically anything with a focus in sales or marketing. With this fresh on his mind, it was time for James to apply to university. James took an interest in Cornell University because of its affordable tuition and applied to its hotel administration school as it offered the only business programs at the time. Fulfilling his grandmother's wish, he was quickly accepted. From that moment, he had 10 days to get everything sorted and headed to Ithaca, New York. The only problem? James had no plan no job, nowhere to stay, and only $11 to his name. Scrambling to pull everything together, James found room and board with a professor who took students in as long as they were willing to do housework. During the week, James went to class, and on the weekends, he worked 12-hour days around the professor's house. However, there was a growing awareness over the years of the conflict that had spread to every corner of the globe. James knew he would likely be drafted, and when he and David were old enough, they both chose to enlist in the armed forces. David joined the army while James chose the navy. Dropping out of Cornell two years after he was accepted, James headed to the recruitment office where he was brought aboard, but it would still take several months for him to be called to service. While he waited, James decided to take a job and get some experience in the hotel field. He wound up working at the Hotel Astor Bar, sitting behind bartenders and ringing up tabs as they served drinks. James's naval service brought him back to Cornell as part of the Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps before he graduated three years after enlisting and went in search of work. Newly married, he looked far and wide for work to support his family and eventually landed an interview to be the director of food service at the YMCA in Wilmington, Delaware for the largest cafeteria in the state. He got the job and he headed out with his wife, Nancy Nicole. At first, the two lived out of a hotel where on the day of their arrival, their car was broken into and their valuables stolen. David had also attended Cornell where he studied hotel and restaurant management, but dropped out. He later attended Northwestern University dropping out but staying in the area and starting a successful pie bakery that served Northwestern students. At the YMCA, James soon found that he had his work cut out for him. He was handed a cafeteria with a bland menu and overstuffed storerooms with decade-old canned goods that were exploding in their cases. So he got to work. Despite improving the menu, clearing out the storerooms and bringing in customers, James didn't make much. His salary was a little over 250 a month, which even at the time was low. So when a local restaurant owner offered him a better paying job, he was interested. Unfortunately for James, he and the restaurant owner didn't get along well. Before long, James got in a confrontation that ended with him being fired. To make matters worse, Nancy was pregnant and the two already had a daughter named Pamela and had taken out a mortgage on a farmhouse. James needed a way to support his family and quickly. But James soon had an idea that meant he'd get to pave his own way. He'd noticed while working at the YMCA that a local restaurant named Toddle House had been busy 24 hours a day. It was a quick service restaurant with only 10 seats, and James believed that if he had opened a similar business, it would be a success. 
James brought his idea to life, naming it the Colonial Inn and renting an empty bike repair shop next door to the Toddle House for $300 a month. He believed that by making his restaurant fancier than its inspiration, he could outcompete them. The Colonial Inn began operation by opening its doors to customers at the start of the new year. It quickly became a local favorite and made 90,000 in its first year alone, of which James took 15,000 home. His instincts had served him well. With the Colonial Inn successful, James took a trip to Miami to visit his father-in-law. While there, his father-in-law showed him a vacant building and suggested he open another restaurant. James saw a thriving food industry with poor service in Miami and decided to take the advice, believing he could find success again. Unfortunately for him, James soon learned that Miami was a seasonal city and the crowds he saw clamoring for food were all gone when his new Brickle Bridge restaurant opened six months later. Little did James know, he would soon cross paths with fellow Cornell dropout David and be forced to make a tough call. Save the business or walk away. While James struggled to keep the Brickle Bridge afloat, David traveled to Jacksonville, Florida to meet with Matthew Burns and Keith Kramer, the founders of a new restaurant chain named Insta Burger King. Named after the Insta machines they used to prepare food. James had already thought of opening up a multi-unit chain restaurant, something he believed Brickle Bridge could never be. However, he needed more capital to join David in the venture. If he wanted in, he only had one choice. He would have to sell Brickle Bridge. A year later, James and David managed to open three Insta Burger King locations, but each one was failing. They offered burgers and shakes for 18 cents each, plus fries and soft drinks for 10 cents each. Examining the business over the next year, James found a few issues. First off, their Insta machines were anything but miraculous and kept failing. Fast and cheap food wasn't much of a draw when their competitors could serve food more consistently. Second, their food wasn't actually that cheap. While they sold burgers for 18 cents, other fast food chains sold them for 15 cents each. Third, the Florida market had entrenched competition. A local chain named Royal Castle had already won customer loyalty with an effective marketing campaign. And fourth, their ordering system was confusing and frustrated customers. Customers ordered food at one window and were expected to pay in advance, something uncommon at the time. Then. They were handed tickets and directed to a second window where they were often asked to repeat their orders despite the tickets, much to their frustration. The two decided that they needed to improve their ordering system. Things needed to be faster and far less frustrating. James described the mentality behind the change as, our customers have two things to spend, time and money, and they would rather spend their money. David and James devised a new, more efficient order system that would let them deliver food in seconds. The solution to the unreliable machines came after David flew into a fit of rage while attempting to repair one and destroyed it with a hatchet from his toolbox. To replace it, he teamed up with an engineer named Carl Sundman to build a flame broiler of his own design. Despite the improvements they made, James and David had a bigger issue. They were running out of money. It didn't matter how much they improved the Insta Burger King experience if they went out of business before anyone could experience it. Fortunately, James's father-in-law began to host events at his home with the sole intent of introducing James to potential investors. During one cocktail party at his father-in-law's home, James was introduced to Harvey Fruhoff of the Detroit-based Fruhoff Trailer Company. During their conversation, James convinced Harvey to invest $65,000 into their company for a 50% stake. David and James used this money to open three new locations, only one of which showed any promise. But they weren't the only ones struggling. Even the original Jacksonville chain was doing poorly. One day, David and James decided to visit one of their new locations on the way from Jacksonville to Miami and were shocked to find it empty. Bored, 
James went for a walk and was drawn in by a line of customers waiting outside a dirty, run-down drive-in restaurant. Curious, James got in line and picked up a pair of burgers for himself and David. What they found was a big, tasty burger with a quarter-pound patty on a five-inch bun with the works. Lettuce, tomatoes, onions, pickles, mayonnaise, and ketchup. After eating, James and David decided that was exactly what their restaurants needed. They came up with plans for a large burger with all the fixings for their chain. They decided to call it the Whopper to make people think of something big. When they got back to Miami, James and David made the Whopper the mainstay of their Insta Burger King locations. They standardized the burger for all seven of their restaurants, sold it for 37 cents, and added advertising proclaiming them the home of the Whopper. It was immediately a huge success and would soon be adopted by other franchises. David and James chose to replace the Insta Shake with a more reliable milkshake maker. With this, they removed the Insta from their branding and became Burger King, home of the Whopper. James and David had begun unofficially leading the company. Even the founders in Jacksonville were following their lead now. In recognition of their success, the founders gave the two exclusive franchising rights to Southern Florida, unaware of how much trouble Jacksonville was really in. Despite following in the footsteps of James and David, the founders failed to find the same success and soon defaulted on their loans. Before the end of the year, Keith and Matthew were out, and their debtor, Ben Stein, was in control. The only problem? Ben had no idea how to run a restaurant, let alone a chain of them. He wanted Miami to take control from him, but they could never find an agreement that worked. It took four years before Ben traveled out to Miami for a fateful lunch where James offered him 15% of whatever they brought in each month for control of the company. Ben leaned back in his chair and replied, You've got yourself a deal. Not only had James and David outlasted the founders of the company, now they were in charge. All they had to do was build their kingdom. Four years after James and David had taken over, Burger King was bringing in impressive profits. So James and David decided that the time had come to go public. However, when they approached Blythe and company to handle their IPO, they were told they were too young, inexperienced, and undercapitalized. The banks didn't believe in them, but someone else did. Pillsbury. Pillsbury was stuck in a competitive grocery store market where sales had stayed flat without increase. They were looking for markets and businesses where they could grow their presence and had been advised to look into the restaurant market, specifically Burger King. A year later, Pillsbury approached David and James about a merger. James was ecstatic at the news, but David wasn't so sure. Still, he eventually agreed and early next year, Pillsbury had bought out Ben's remaining stake for $2.5 million, plus $50,000 for attorney fees. Following the merger, James became a member of the Pillsbury management team and a director of the company. Meanwhile, David, who had wanted to stay independent, felt the call of his old entrepreneurial spirit and left to create a new restaurant, Bodega Steak. To drive Burger King's success, Pillsbury poached a key figure from their competitor and the world's largest fast food chain, McDonald's. Former McDonald's executive Donald Smith quickly set about building the fast food chain into something greater with two key strategies. First, he reworked the franchising system, changing it so that franchisees could not own locations in other chains and that franchisees had to live within an hour of their locations. These changes were to instill brand loyalty and to prevent franchisees from owning restaurants they wouldn't travel to. Second, Donald took on McDonald's in the children's market by creating new characters for advertisements. These included Sir Shakes a Lot, a robot named the Wizard of Fries, and of course, the Burger King, who also happened to be a magician. Under Donald's leadership, Burger King's profits rose by 15%, but his reign was short. Only two years after taking over, he was poached yet again, this time by Pepsi. 
His departure saw Burger King's profits start to slide back down, meaning that someone else would need to take the throne. With Donald gone, Pillsbury crowned another restaurant executive, Norman Brinker, who founded the restaurant chain Steak and Ale before it had been acquired by Pillsbury. Two years after Donald had left, Norman was transferred to Burger King, where he introduced a new marketing campaign, the Battle of the Burgers, which pushed the narrative that Americans preferred Burger King's flame grilled burgers to McDonald's. Under Norman's leadership, Burger King came close to catching up with McDonald's. However, just like Donald, Norman had a brief reign as burger royalty. Only a year after taking the throne, he left to join Chili's, and sales slumped once more. Five years later, Burger King would begin to switch hands when Pillsbury was acquired by British company Grand Metropolitan PLC. Burger King then expanded its kingdom to the UK. Yet, just as things were looking up for Burger King, it was snubbed again. Nine years after acquiring Burger King, Grand Metropolitan PLC merged with brewing behemoth Guinness to form Diageo PLC. Diageo had less interest in fast food endeavors and instead turned their attention to their alcoholic beverage brands. Three years later, Diageo expressed an interest in selling Burger King. Soon, someone else would be wearing the crown, Texas Pacific Group. With capital from both Bain Capital and Goldman Sachs Capital Partners, Texas Pacific bought Burger King for $1.5 billion. This would be just the first of several times the crown would trade hands through the next two decades. Under Texas Pacific, more changes were introduced to the Burger King brand. Four years after acquiring it, Texas Pacific took Burger King public a second time. Then, three years later, they introduced the Whopper Bar, where customers could watch their burgers be built by Whopperistas. A year later, Burger King was taken private again after being bought by 3G Capital for $3.26 billion. That lasted two years before it went public again, before finally merging with Canadian fast food brand Tim Hortons after another two years. After the merger, Burger King and Tim Hortons were both run by the newly formed parent company Restaurant Brands International. The merger seems to have done well for Burger King, as four years later it reclaimed the title of second largest burger chain in the United States with $9.6 billion in sales, edging out Wendy's for the title, who had made $9.3 billion in sales that year. The solid foundation that David and James built with the Whopper earned Burger King the reputation for high quality, tasty, and affordable food. As the crown traded hands, others built on top of their foundation, entrenching Burger King's popularity with solid advertising, low costs that let them keep their products affordable, and a simple menu with something for everyone, all of which led to Burger King's continued success as a brand. Today, Burger King is one of the world's largest chains with thousands of locations in over 100 countries. As for the Whopper, it remains its most iconic menu item, helping to bring in over $1 billion in revenue, and is listed as one of America's favorite burgers. This is the story of how a once-fledgling chain became a global billion-dollar powerhouse through a series of takeovers and a stolen recipe. For more interesting stories about today's biggest companies, don't forget to subscribe to our channel.